uh, thank you for joining in uh, for this session today. So my name is Balram Reddy. I am uh, the managing partner of Spectrum Auditing and Spectrum Accounting. I am also a partner with SBC Tax Consulting LLC. Uh, I am a chartered accountant from India with an experience of about 20 years. I work with various big four firms like PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. And uh, Spectrum Auditing, we started like in 2015, which is about eight years old form. And uh, we provide services like audit, accounting, VAT, consulting services, company formation, and other services. And SBC is another form which we started last year, which is primarily going to focus more on corporate tax and transfer pricing. So along with me, I have uh, Rishabh Agarwal, who is also one of the partners in SBC Tax Consulting LLC. He is uh, as well chartered accountant from India, and uh, he's been speaking on uh, tax matters, in particular on transfer pricing and global taxation on various forums for uh, the last couple of years in UAE and uh, at various other forums uh, in India also. So this is about the speakers. Unfortunately, Pratiksha could not make for today's uh, session. We both will be taking care of this session. And uh, so as you all know, so we are going to focus more on uh, taxation for individuals and uh, place of uh, effective management, POEM, which is one of the important uh, area to look for most of the businesses people who are managing their businesses out from uh, UAE, if they have outside UAE businesses. And we will also look into the permanent establishments concept. So as I mentioned, this is what we are going to talk about. Uh, we'll just quickly look at the background of uh, a corporate tax. Very few slides, we will be touch basing on them. And then we'll get into taxation for individuals and then so on. If you have any questions in between, uh, we request you to drop in, uh, in the chat box. We will look at, them in the, we'll look at them at the end of the session. Of course, we'll have a separate uh, Q&A session at the end of the our presentation so we can go through them uh, that time also and you can also ask questions if you have any more so, but before uh, getting into the topic i would like to tell you that you know this session is only a, an attempt for us to uh, give you a little bit more understanding of the law with respect to these uh, topics and uh, it is only the personal views of the uh, present presenters here and uh, you need to look at the law uh, and then take a decision before you do anything based on the information that we share here. So that's the primary thing that we want to be clear on. And uh, the responses to the questions also could be, uh, no, uh, it is only based on the information that you provide to us. So it may vary if you have to consider even other facts into the into the consideration, then the conclusion could be different. So this being the context, so I just want to uh, you know, clear the, the thing and the stand before we go ahead. So just to talk about the you know, basics of corporate tax, as most of you know, the corporate tax law is already effective from 1st June 2023 onwards. The applicability of the corporate taxes for the companies is going to be based on their financial years. So the initial applicability will begin uh, based on the financial year, as I mentioned. So if your financial year is like you know, July to June, so you must be already getting into this. So your, for your company, the corporate tax would have been applicable from 1st July 23 onwards. So first financial year to which the corporate tax will be applicable is 1st July 23 to 30th June 24. And uh, in UAE, most of the companies uh, generally follow January to December as their financial year. So for all those companies, the corporate tax will be applicable from 1st January 24 onwards. So first financial year for them will be 1st January 24 to 31st December 24, uh, for which the corporate tax will be applicable. And they need to file their corporate tax returns within uh, nine months from the end of the financial year. So, which is going to be, you know, 30th September 2025 for the companies which have got January to December as their financial year. So, not only filing the returns, but even making the payment of corporate tax, if at all if you have to pay tax, should be done before these, this date, which is 30th September 25, which is nothing but nine months from the end of the financial year. So, you can see the other dates applicable on the screen. So, depending upon your financial year, 
the applicability will vary. So the tax rate generally applicable are like two, two categories, rather we can say three categories also, but broadly two categories. One is like, you know, regular corporate tax rate, which is 0% uh, uh, up to the profits or taxable income of 375,000 dirhams and 9% in excess of that amount of your profits. So this is the general, uh, uh, these are the general rates that are applicable for most of the, uh, for all the mainland entities. Uh, and maybe some of the free zone entities also will have, will have these rates applicable. And uh, the other category of uh, the rates are uh, for a free zone entity, if it, a free zone entity becomes a qualifying free zone person, for them, uh, the tax rate will be 0% on qualifying income and 9% on non-qualifying income. So when we say 9% on non-qualifying income, this is going to be straight 9% without getting any 375,000 base limit or base as the benefit. Even if you have 10 dirhams as your qualifying non-qualifying income, on that 9% will be calculated and tax will be paid. So these are the rates that are applicable. For the free zones which are not getting the status of uh, qualifying free zone person, for them, the general rates, which is which are 0% up to 375,000 dirhams and 9% in excess of will be applicable. So just to understand some of the rules are specific to the, uh, the organizations based on their form and location or licensing authorities. So on the left hand side, you can see the geographic form of the country, UAE. So UAE as a whole uh, is divided like, you know, mainland and free zone for licensing purpose. And we also have a concept called offshore entities, of course, which is, which is again, you know, part of free zone broadly can be called as, that is for corporate tax purpose. So free zones again, further divided into financial free zones, other free zones, these other free zones can also be like designated free zones or designated zones and other free zones. Corporate tax purpose, designated zones and other free zones are the classification that are relevant. There are some uh, rules which are specific only to designated free zone based entities and some other specific to the free zone entities and a few others for mainland entities. So that is the reason why I just wanted to mention about the, the geographic form of the country. On right hand side, you can see various legal forms of the organizations or businesses that we have in UAE. The ones which are highlighted in blue color, like sole proprietorship, civil, com civil company, partnership, and so on. Though you have license in those forms, but for co corporate tax purpose, those are not considered as independent entity or independent person. The owner along with these forms together will be considered as one taxable person and all the incomes will be taxed in the hands of the individual or the owner of those organizations. So the registration will be done in the name of the owner. Whatever entities that you have in these forms owned by that particular individual, all of them will be clubbed and will be filed as one return. All the incomes will be clubbed and filed as one return. So on right hand side, on, uh, uh, highlighted in red boxes. So these entities or these uh, form of organizations are considered as independent entities. The legal forms of them are considered as independent from the owners or shareholders. So like limited liability company, public shareholding company, private shareholding companies, so on and so on. All of these entities, they are independent, which means uh, the registration will be done in the name of those entities separately and uh, corporate tax returns, filing and other compliances will be done in the name of those respective entities. Here, free zone companies, we may have free zone establishments, which are nothing but sole proprietorships, which again will fall under sole proprietorship category. If you have free zone companies or free zone companies LLC form, all those will be considered as independents, independent form entities. So uh, when we look at the persons or type of persons, generally we can categorize juridical persons and natural persons. Juridical persons are those uh, uh, persons or entities which are formed or formed here based on a legal or a statute or uh, the legal entities are generally considered as uh, juridical persons. And natural persons are like individuals like you and me. And all these persons can be like you know, exempted persons or taxable persons for corporate tax purpose. We'll look at the in the following slide as to which all will be considered as taxable persons. There's a whole list of exempted persons given by the law and corporate tax law. We are not going to look at that particular category, but 
we have the data available on internet and even in our channel also we have given the list of those exempted persons categories you can refer to them so but yeah primarily taxable persons taxable persons can be resident persons or non-resident persons resident person can be like you know incorporated in uae entities any license which is issued here in uae they all uh, fall under this category and those entities can be issued by mainland uh, authorities or DED mostly, or they can be issued by the free zone, uh, free zone authorities. So they can be mainland entities or free zone persons. But all these entities are generally considered as taxable persons unless they fall under exempted category. So which means you need to comply with all the requirements of the corporate tax law. Then the second category is the entities which are incorporated outside UAE. But however, those entities are controlled effectively and managed from UAE. So which is nothing but place of uh, no effective management. The concept that we are going to talk more in detail in the following slides by you know, Rishabh. So if any business which is incorporated outside UAE, but it is effectively controlled and managed from UAE, then that outside UAE business can become or could become a resident person, taxable person and resident person for corporate tax law purpose in UAE and that will be subject to tax and they are expected to comply with all the requirements of the law. And third category is about natural persons, the individuals who are residents here. So if they conduct any business or business activity in UAE or any other business activity outside UAE, all of that will be considered as taxable in UAE and those natural persons become taxable persons though they are performing them in individual capacity if they become business activity or businesses then they will be subject to tax and uh, we have non-residents non-residents are not uh, the persons who are either you know, legal entities in uae or people or natural persons who are not residents in uae so they all fall under this category of non-residents so, but though they are non-residents, they may be subject to tax and they may become taxable persons in UAE in the circumstances which are listed here. If any non-resident person has got any permanent establishment in UAE, so entity which is outside UAE, but they have a permanent establishment in UAE, not having any license issued here, then they will become taxable persons. Again, this concept will be discussed in detail by Rishabh in the following slides. And then second thing is about having nex nexus here in UAE. So a non-resident person as a company or an individual who is not resident, if they have nexus, so nexus they mentioned clearly as having any real estate property owned here in UAE. So through this, they become, or they will be considered as having nexus in UAE and they become a uh, taxable person is here in UAE and they are expected to comply with the uh, requirements of the corporate tax law in UAE. Not only this, any entity outside UAE or person outside UAE, if they are deriving any income or if they have any UAE state sourced income, then they also become taxable persons here. So what do you mean by state sourced income? So here, if any company outside UAE, they are doing any business with a company in UAE, then that can be considered as a, a deriving UAE sourced income in the hands of that uh, outside UAE entity. So they become taxable persons, but however, in this category, what happens is that they are not expected to register here and comply with the requirements of the law. But however, the customer in UAE with whom they are doing business. So these customers in UAE are expected to take care of this compliance on behalf of the outside UAE entity uh, in the form of uh, doing a uh, deducting withholding tax. So withholding tax, uh, this concept also will be uh, Touched based, touched based by Rishabh in the following slides. But however, the withholding tax at the moment in UAE is 0%. So which means the companies in UAE, when they are buying anything from outside UAE, at the time of making the payment, they need not to do any deductions towards withholding tax. But however, in future, if the government comes up with any other rate other than 0% for withholding tax, then the companies are expected to deduct that much amount and make the payment on that to the government in whichever way they mention. So this is about uh, non-resident uh, category. 
taxable presence. So let's see uh, the taxation for natural persons uh, related income. So these are the definitions that are given in the law. So in the explanatory given uh, guide, they have mentioned that natural person means an individual. As I mentioned, an individual like you and me will be considered as natural persons. And other reference given with respect to us is that a residential person who conducts a business or business activity in the state is considered to be a taxable person for the purpose of UAE corporate tax law and subject to corporate tax on their taxable income derived from UAE and from outside UAE. So this is the main clause which actually pushes us to subject to tax uh, though you are an individual. But the main thing to understand here is that you are conducting a business or a business activity. You may or may not have a license, but you're conducting a business activity here. Or you're conducting business activity outside UAE from here, in control from here. So then all of that, whatever income you generate out of that particular business becomes a, a taxable income and you'll be subject to a tax. You are expected to register and then uh, uh, submit the corporate tax return and then make the payment of the tax. The other relevant clause that we can see here is that a, a non-resident natural person can be subject to corporate tax if it has a permanent establishment in the UAE, derives UAE source income or has an excess in the UAE. If income is earned without having a PE in UAE, then such person is excluded from taking corporate tax registration. As I mentioned in my previous slide, a non-resident person who is not a resident in UAE, if they are earning any income, okay, through a permanent establishment in UAE, then that income will be subject to tax in UAE. Or they are deriving UAE source income also. They are being outside, they are providing any services to UAE entities. Then they may be considered as having uh, UAE source income, in which case they are expected to register and then comply with the tax requirements. But however, they are doing or getting this uh, income without having permanent establishment. In such case, registration is not expected or not mandatory. As I mentioned, only withholding tax is what will be considered, which is zero at the moment. So further to understand, now what all will be subject to tax in the hands of individuals and what will not be subject to tax? We have seen business income is subject to tax, but what are the uh, sources of incomes which are exclusively or explicitly mentioned in the law that which are not subject to tax. They clearly mentioned that uh, the natural persons, whatever they get in the form of wages or any other connected payments, which are nothing but allowances, bonuses, and any other compensation that they receive uh, by having employee or employ employee and employer uh, connection or relationship, relation. So all that income that they generate out of that particular contract is not subject to tax. So your salaries and related uh, compensation that you get from your employer is not subject to tax. That is clear. And you can also see the personal investment income. Any investment activity in your personal account, not conducted through any license, or not considered commercial business in accordance with the commercial law, so that whole income is not considered as taxable income. So that will not be subject to tax. So your personal investment income could be like, you know, uh, you are getting dividends out of the investments held by you as an individual out of your own personal income sources. Or you may get uh, interest on uh, deposits with banks. Or you may get any capital gain out of sale of your investments. So any of similar kind of income that you generate, that is not subject to tax in the hands of the individuals. And third category is that real estate investment income. So you as an individual, if you're getting any income out of real estate income or real estate investments, that is also not considered as taxable income. They clearly mentioned that investment activity directly or indirectly, sale, leasing, subleasing, and renting of land or real estate property in the state and not conducted or does not require a license. So the second point is very, very important. 
they clearly say that okay you have real estate investment income but that particular activity that you are doing does it require you to have a license and then conduct those activities or is it not so at the moment it's not very clear that you know uh, certain amount of uh, investment if you have or certain amount of income if you have a certain number of properties if you hold you are expected to go for licensing uh, or is it not required so that kind of uh, clarity is still not there but however if you are employing some people and employing them to manage those properties then obviously you are expected to have license and then conduct those activities in which case whatever you in income you generate out of that particular activity though those investments in real estate are held in your individual name since you are conducting it uh, by taking a license so that becomes a business income and then it will be subject to tax so however if the natural person performs any business activities other than mentioned above like the income that are not subject to tax then the revenue from these activities is subject to tax if the revenue exceeds 1 billion dirhams so you have a business income or any other income which is not falling in this category which is not subject to tax so it means you have a taxable income so you are expected to register and comply with it only if your income exceeds 1 million dirhams in a calendar year so as long as that is not crossing so you are not required to register yourself so just to clear it one more time that you know we are considering only business income or income that you generate out of business or business activities in individual capacity or as a person natural person so you'll be you are subject to tax or you are expected to register and comply with the tax requirements only if your income exceeds 1 million dirhams in a calendar year okay so this threshold will be calculated by considering all the revenues earned by the natural person from sole establishment unincorporated partnerships and other businesses that are subject to tax in the hands of the individual so this second part of it is very very important that you are a natural person and you are conducting business on your own without having license that becomes a business income subject to tax in your hands and you may also have sole establishment or sole establishments or you may be part of an unincorporated partnership so income from all these will be considered for this particular threshold amount of 1 million dirhams and if it is exceeding all this income together if it is exceeding 1 million dirhams then you will be subject to tax you are expected to register and then comply with the uh, requirements there are the other areas because we touched base on this quickly uh, the business income that you get out of sole proprietorship as i mentioned sole proprietorship on its own is not expected or not required to register it will be subject to tax in the hands of the owner the owner will be registered and the income generated out of this sole proprietorship will be subject to tax in the hands of the owner however you need to look at that 1 million dirhams and all all that that we discussed in the previous slide similar rules will be applicable for unincorporated partnerships the partnerships which are not registered but you are conducting business in that form then any income generated by those partners or in that unincorporated partnerships the respective share of that individual or partner from this unincorporated partnership will be subject to tax in the hands of the partner in individual capacity it is uh, there is an option given for unincorporated partnerships also that all the partners come together if they want the authority to consider that as a taxable person or a separate taxable person then that unincorporated partnership can be considered as a taxable person in which case the partners will not be subject to tax in their individual capacity because the partnership is itself is considered for uh, taxation and it becomes taxable person and some of the family foundations so, so uh, that also similar to sole proprietorship in or unincorporated partnerships in most of the cases uh but if you uh, maintain that family foundation as an independent organization and the activities are conducted in such a way then also you can uh, request the authority to consider the family foundation as a taxable person independently in which case the the members of the family foundation will not be considered for taxation for this income it will be only the family foundation that will be considered as a taxable person and that will be complying with the requirements 
what what are the compliances and filing requirements for natural persons and we discussed this in my previous slide also that uh, a natural person who is earning income more than 1 million dirhams which is uh, taxable in a calendar year so they should register themselves for uh, corporate tax purpose and unincorporated partnership also will be considered for that particular purpose and after registering for corporate tax purpose once then you are expected to continue that registration unless uh, you comply with one of the conditions mentioned in deregistration generally it is uh, upon the death of the individual or if that individual is no more conducting that particular business then you are uh, uh, you can go for deregistration of the uh, corporate tax registration unless until uh, these two one of these two happens so you are expected to continue with the compliance and uh, uh, yeah as i mentioned so irrespective of the amount so you are expected to continue with uh, corporate tax return filing also in the following years once you are registered there are certain other questions that generally are been asked so i just wanted to bring them up here so will income earned by natural persons from bank deposits be subject to ua corporate tax uh, as i mentioned in my previous slide so these deposits whatever you make are out of your own personal savings then of course that is a personal income and that will not be subject to tax in the corporate taxes but if you are collecting money from others and then uh, depositing them in the banks and if you are conducting this as a business activity you may or may not have license but it considered it is considered as business activity income then that could be subject to tax so you need to be very careful as to in what capacity and uh, how you are making these deposits into bank second question is that like what is personal investment income under corporate tax law so they have clearly mentioned in the you know faqs that personal investment income is income earned by a natural person from investment activities conducted in their personal capacity including interest or dividends it excludes income from a commercial business or from activity conducted or required to be conducted through a license from a licensing authority in uae as i mentioned so your investments you are doing in your individual capacity and you are not expected to take any license then it is fine that will not be subject to tax but however if you are expected to take a license to meet the requirements of uae laws and uh, you are generating income out of that particular business then of course it will be subject to tax so similar condition will be applicable for real estate income also they mentioned real estate income is income earned by a natural person from uh, an investment activity related directly or indirectly to land or real estate property in the uae which is not conducted or required to be conducted through a license issued by a licensing authority in uae so this is uh, one of the gray areas where the clarity or anal analysis of the uh, intention and the way you are conducting the business or activity is more important to conclude whether the income generated out of this real estate investments are subject to tax or not as i mentioned we need to look at like you no know, three to four uh, important uh, parameters to look at it the one important thing is that are you expected to take a license to conduct this particular real estate investment activity in uae or not second thing is that how are you operating it are you operating it are you managing or maintaining those real estate properties or investments on individual capacity or do you have a team of people who are managing those properties and what is your intention of course the intention is to earn income but are you conducting in a nature or in the form of business so there are the few important things that we need to consider to decide whether that income that you generate out of that real estate investment is subject to tax or not the other question is that if a natural person owns several commercial properties in their name generating rental income above 1 million dirhams which uh, will such activity still qualify for exclusion for corporate tax purposes so this is again i have taken it from uh, faqs from ministry of uh, finance website in that they clearly mentioned that if it is generated uh, out of the like you no know, properties owned by individual in individual capacity and yeah 
if that individual is not expected to have the license, then it is not considered as taxable income as such, even if that income exceeds 1 million dirhams. But however, if it is other way around, like, you know, if you are expected to have a license and all those things, then definitely it will be subject to tax. The other question generally being asked is that can a national person elect for application of the small business rate? So now let's say that yeah, you have a business income, you may or may not have a license. Let's say you do not have a license, but your income is more than 1 million dirhams. We understood that you are expected to register and then comply with the requirements. But the small business relief, which is nothing but for businesses which have got 3 million dirhams turnover or less, subject to meeting other conditions, so they can go for this option or this relief, in which case the tax payable by them will be zero. They're not considered as having taxable income. So if you have a revenue exceeding as an individual business income exceeding 1 million dirhams, but less than 3 million dirhams, can you go for this small business relief as an individual or a natural person? The answer is yes, you can go for that. And uh, uh, you can, but the thing is that you need to still register because the revenue is more than 1 million dirhams. You need to register for corporate tax and then submit our uh, corporate tax returns at the end of the year. And you can go for the small business relief, in which case you will not end up, you will not be paying any corporate tax as such. The other question is that what is the treatment of payments made to the connected persons by the companies in the hands of those individuals? So income, like no, I'm a owner of a company. I am charging or taking salary from the business. So in the hands of this owner or individual, what happens to that income? So it's a different scenario. What happens to the expense or payments made by the companies in the books of companies, but in the hands of individuals that becomes non-taxable because I'm doing this in my individual capacity and uh, that is not considered as taxable income. As long as this payments made by the company to this owner or uh, the connected persons is at arm's length and all those things, then uh, that income is not subject to tax in the hands of individuals. Can we deduct expenses if the revenue of the individual is subject to tax? Let's say that you have a business income and you do not have a license, which generally is not advisable in a legal framework here. If you're conducting any commercial activity or business activity, you are expected to have license and then comply with the licensing requirements also. But let's say that you have an income and which is more than 1 million dirhams in a year. And you may end up in incurring some expenses to own that income. So the question is that, can you show these expenses and then reduce from that income and pay tax only on that net income? So the answer is that most probably yes, that if you incur any in expenditure exclusively for that particular business uh, activity or to generate business income, as long as that is not contradicting the other requirements of the law, like, you know, any uh, expenditure incurred without uh, proper supporting document or expenditure incurred or paid, which is not uh, no, legal, all those points, whatever mentioned in the law, as long as they are not falling in that category, then the expenses can be adjusted against the income and then pay tax on the income. But the other thing is that the salary paid or can I show as an individual who is earning business income, can I show salary as cost? Uh, I think it's most probably not. You cannot pay salary to yourself. So that's the basic uh, you know, uh, conflict that we see. So we think that it is not deductible. But other expenses incurred for in, uh, generating that particular business income yeah, can be shown as expense and then deduct. So there are a few questions that you know, we came across. Uh, of course, we cannot answer if you have more questions in the chat uh, at the end of the session. So this is one uh, small case study that I've taken on illustration. A natural person, Mr. Q, based in UAE, is self-employed and earns the following income during the calendar year 2024. Real estate investment income in an individual capacity, 2.3 million is what he earned. It could be in the form of rent or capital gain. Income derived from providing consulting services, 1.9 million dirhams. So in this case, uh, what will be the taxability of the income that he generated out of these two sources? So the answer is that the only income derived from 
providing consulting services should be taken into consideration when calculating the turnover. It is very obvious that real estate income, we mentioned clearly that it is an individual capacity that we earned. So it is not subject to tax. So that will not be considered for computation purpose. However, the consultancy services is subject to tax and that 1.9 million dirham will be considered for taxation purpose. The real estate investment income is not derived through a license and thus is not considered to be a business or business activity for Mr. Q and therefore it is not included in the turnover. So the turnover is only 1.9 million which exceeds 1 million dirhams threshold. However, since that amount is less than 3 million dirhams, uh, which is a threshold for uh, uh, small business relief, that individual, Mr. Q, can opt for the small business relief and in which case uh, he need not to pay any tax on that. But however, he is expected to register and file corporate tax return. So this is how we have to analyze the income of the individuals and then accordingly decide what is taxable and not. So this is what I wanted to share with respect to the taxation of the income generated by the national persons. So uh, the other concepts and topics, uh, I invite uh, Rishabh to take it over. Uh, Rishabh, over to you. Perfect. So uh, this shows everyone is alive. Uh, and I'll continue with the, the topics uh, given further. And before that, uh, my gratitude to Balram sir to cover uh, a tough one on natural person and introducing corporate tax and setting the ground. And also to Spectrum to have have this uh, with SBC. And uh, I'll, I'll take it ahead. And as suggested by Balram sir, we'll take the questions towards the end of the session. So... I think that that ground will be covered. So starting on the, what you see on screen is place of effective management. Uh, I think it's pretty much clear on why we are, uh, uh, you know, talking about it or why we want to study about it is because place of effective management is one of the criteria which defines your residential status or uh, defines whether you are a taxable person or not. And we can see that uh, one of the criteria is was uh, that you know if you are incorporated outside or uh, outside the UAE, but effectively being managed from the UAE, uh, you are considered as a taxable person. And uh, the first question is, what is the consequence? So the consequence is that your worldwide income gets taxed in the UAE if you are effectively uh, managed and controlled from the UAE from uh, that perspective. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons. And uh, the name looks very, very easy. And you know, the term is uh, pretty familiar in terms of, we call it poem, poem or uh, poem and play, the full form is place of effective management, but it is not, you know, as pleasurable and as enjoyable as the uh, poem we, we used to study in school or any anywhere else. So seeing this term, we should not be deceived by how it looks or by its looks. Uh, poem is one of the most litigious and subjective uh, uh, topic or I would say issue in terms of corporate tax, not just in UAE but globally because the guidelines, uh, what are provided for poem and uh, the way it is being judged is uh, very subjective um, and why the taxpayers strive to defend or mitigate the risk of poem is because of the draconian consequence uh, of, you know, the global income being taxed in the state or in the jurisdiction where you have uh, effective management. So building upon the foundation, uh, uh, which Balram sir has explained on, you know, how you become a taxable person. So one of the box over there was that you are uh, established outside UAE or elsewhere, but you are being effectively managed uh, from uh, effectively managing the troll in the UAE. So one thing to clarify here is that we do not have detailed guidelines on poem there are certain aspects that have been given um, you know in the explanatory guide or the general uh, corporate tax guide by released by the fta however uh, what you see on screen is a guidance taken from the oecd model tax convention the commentary of article 4 so this is uh, the international best practices or let us say this is what we have as of now uh, in terms of assessing your poem risk of any entity which has been incorporated outside the UAE, but 
may be it is being effectively managed or controlled from the UAE. So what does, you know, effectively manage and control mean? So I really want all of you to talk to me in the chat box right now that what do you understand when I say, okay, there is an entity A incorporated in BVI or Panama or Cayman. For that matter, let us say even in UK or Germany, any country outside UAE. What do you understand by the phrase that it is being effectively managed and controlled from the UAE? So just put in the chat box in your understanding. I mean, there's there are a lot of technical terms on the screen, but I'll try to make it more simple and more uh, relatable to you. Okay, one one uh, question, uh, I mean, one response is that the head office is in the UAE. Okay, head office again, uh, sir, is a very debatable term. What is a head office or a headquarters? So another response is directors are resident here and board meetings are held in UAE. Okay, perfect. Mixing my points, what you see on the screen. Uh, broadly speaking, yeah, all decisions taken in the UAE in substance. Key decisions happening from UAE tax jurisdiction, place of control, taking operational related decisions from UAE. So from your responses, what I understand is that you have a pretty fair bit under, uh, you know, understanding or uh, of the concept of FOIAM. Uh, so I will, uh, first I'll put you the broad uh, framework for poem is that you're you're taking you know your senior management or you are taking the strategic or the most important decisions from the uae that is uh you know the basic framework for poem when we would say whether all decisions need to be taken from the uae the answer is no day-to-day -day operational management or you know the operational decisions might or might not be a very strong factor. Uh, yeah, will might or might not be very strong factor for determining poem. Uh, there's one response is, in my opinion, taking operational decisions will be part of permanent establishment instead of poem. So don't worry, we are covering both the topics here. So you would get your answer on whether it's part of poem or it's part of permanent establishment. So, and what is the difference on, you know, the operational decision perspective? Right. So coming on to the technical aspect, what you see here on screen, uh, apart from the last one, that is the place of residence of board members. Uh, so the first six uh, factors that you see here are directly picked, copied and pasted from the OECD model tax convention. So what does the OECD says is that to determine place of effective management for any entity, you need to consider these six factors in specific apart from when you are you know broadly consider considering the strategic and the management or managerial decisions uh, or where these where these decisions are made because what you will see from these six factors is that uh, these six factors help you answer certain questions which will eventually determine where is the decision making happening or where in effect the decision making is happening towards you know once i go on with these uh, factors one by one i'll ask you a question towards the end uh, i'll ask you a question now but you can answer towards the end what if these factors are decentralized in various countries or various jurisdictions and you are being managed from more than one jurisdiction so can you be effectively managed from more than one jurisdiction yes or no uh, is, is a question that you will answer once we complete the concept of poem. So just keep that question in mind and listen to me uh, with, the, with that bug or a question in your mind. And, you know, a lot of things will be clarified here. Yeah. So the first factor over here is the place of board meetings. So there are various jurisdictions wherein still there is no law for virtual board meetings because the prerogative of conducting the board meetings or the uh, owners to conduct board meetings come from the commercial law of a particular jurisdiction. So if there is, let us say, a company in Panama, if the commercial law of Panama allows conducting a board meeting virtually only, then you do a board meeting virtually. Otherwise, you do it physically. So you, that's one place you have to look. Why board meetings or place of board meetings is a factor? Because the board is the ultimate management of, the, of a company or a juridical person. 
So board is the one who is taking the tough calls. The board is the one who is making all the major decisions, the strategic decisions. And uh, it is the one who has the managerial control. So that is why plays of board meetings is, uh, you know, one of the most heavyweight factors in determining poem. Now the question would be, if virtual board meetings allowed are allowed, then what? Right? Because the world has changed, the law is not going to change at the, at the speed of technology or at the speed at which the economics or the world is changing in terms of, you know, being advanced more uh, towards uh, getting decentralized or getting virtual uh, even in their businesses. So once uh, you consider where the board meetings are held and the answer comes that, okay, it's on Zoom, just like we are meeting on Zoom. So what to consider next? So to mitigate this or, you know, to go more deeper, what is taken is that where the board members are attending the board meeting from or what is the tax residential status of the board members who are attending the meeting? So let us say there are five board members. They all reside in different GCC countries. Let's say one is in Saudi, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, and one is in UAE. So six of them. So they do board meetings on Zoom for a Bahrain incorporated company. And uh, where do you think, you know, it lies? Uh, where, how would you conclude where the board meeting was held? So the answer is that it was a Zoom. It was online, right? But then you go on to the second factor, deciding on, okay, where these people attended the board meeting from. Okay, everyone attended from their home or their office in their respective countries. So their residence and their place of attending the board meeting again was decentralized to various jurisdictions. So what happens is we jump on to the next factor over here, considering that where the CEO and the senior management is carrying out its activities. So usually, uh, you know, there will be a lot of scenarios where the offshore, I mean, I say offshore, I mean, companies incorporated outside UAE were, will be having the senior management or the group CEO or CFOs or the C-level executives sitting here in UAE, in Dubai specifically, because they want to enjoy the lifestyle of Dubai and would not like to move out to any other country. So the uh, what happens in the major or the senior management is sitting in the in UAE and there is operational or, you know, a manager sitting in the other country who is actually just executing what has been told to him. He does not have a decision-making power. So this is what we have to see that how is the decision-making power split between people or the senior management sitting in the UAE and the manager or the head or whoever is being, you know, responsible for the operational part sitting in the country of incorporation. So the decision-making power split has to be recognized, acknowledged, and then evaluated in terms of the second factor that where the CEO and other senior management carry out their activities. Coming on to this controversial thing that place of day-to-day -day affairs of the management are carried out. So most of the times the day-to-day -day affairs would be carried out in the country of incorporation if it is an operational entity. If it is a holding entity or just a conduit, then you will not have any operations anyway or day-to-day -day affairs to be managed. So we are, we are considering it's an operational entity. So the day-to-day -day management is in the country of incorporation. Now my question to you is whether day-to-day -day management is a very strong factor to decide because we are talking about strategic and, you know, uh, high-level decision-making, uh, effective management. So whether day-to-day -day management has the power or has the authority to go beyond a certain limit which has been provided either by the board or by the senior management. Just put yes or no in the chat box. So I'll put my question again, whether the day-to-day -day management has the powers to do strategic decision-making or they are just executing most of the times what, what flows from the top, from the CEO, CFO sitting in a different jurisdiction or from uh, the board or the instructions of the board. No, mostly following orders. Okay, that's one response. L not that much relevant. So relevant or not, we will think, just answer this question on yes or no, whether uh, they have that, usually have that decision-making power in your practical experience or not. Okay, a lot of answers for no. Please, all, someone also answer yes, then only we can have a debate. How it is possible that everyone agrees on the same page? Okay, but I'm still getting no. So, no problem. So, however, I mean, I'll conclude on this point also. The OECD mentions this as a factor. Yes, for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So someone said yes, so we can have a debate about it. But I'll still conclude now due to the paucity of time. So however, 
oecd mentions you know place where day to day affairs of management is carried out as one of the factors to determine poem but then what it also says in the next next paragraph is that it is a light factor i mean it does not have a lot of weightage it might or might not affect the determination of poem so it keeps the ball open it keeps the framework open that yes we recommend you to see it but we would not say that you just conclude on that one factor that okay board meetings held in uae senior management is sitting in uae the day to day affairs let us say are in uh, uk so the poem goes to uk no that cannot be the case so what you have to do is you have to consider it but you have to give it less weightage and you know you will observe from left to right on you know first row and then left to right again on the second row that these factors have been placed in the order of their importance the first one being more important the second being a little less important so in the order of their importance or weightage these factors have been placed so when we go to headquarters someone said that uh, place of effective management is where the head office is located so my question to that uh, participant or to all of you is what is a head office or what is a headquarters whether the corporate office where everyone uh, c level executive sits are the head office or headquarters whether where the company is incorporated is considered as the headquarters for that company so a or b what is it place of incorporation okay anyone for where the senior management is sitting is is the head office or the headquarters or place where you know registered address okay as ho okay that's that's nice place of business or registered office is the headquarters or head office so i am asking you all these questions because uh, okay mentioned as a ho during formation of company so i am asking so i was explaining myself that why i am asking you these questions because again there is no detailed guidance on it that what is a headquarters i might consider it as the registered address i might consider it as the address given in the uh license or uh, in the company for at the time of company formation as dho i might consider it as uh where my all c level executives are sitting because headquarters is something defined you know which has uh, which literally has power to control so again so it's very difficult to examine where the headquarters are uh, because there is no set definition for it right going ahead we have the next factor over here as law of uh, law of the country you know law of which country governs the company's legal status so 100% of the times it is the company of uh, sorry it's the country of incorporation because the commercial law of that country governs the legal status whether it will become an llc a partnership an incorporate partnership single owner llc so all of this would flow in from the types of uh, entities you can form in that jurisdiction so the answer would always be into a positive Uh, in a positive sense that okay where the company is incorporated the laws of that country governs the legal status of the entity or the company and finally on the accounting records again a challenge comes in that the accounting records are on the cloud cloud server we don't know we are using amazon web services a server might be in india a server farm that could be in kentucky in us so where the server is we do not have information so again as i said that these factors are placed in the line, uh, order of importance so these two factors in terms of accounting records or laws of uh, which con uh, country governs the legal status of the company are uh, very very less important as compared to the first couple of factors in terms of board meeting place of board meetings and uh, place where the ceo and the other man other senior management sits so this is the crux of place of effective management and uh, you know when i say it is a very litigious topic and when i say it is something so subjective that today even if let us say balram sir is making one assessment on the same client and i am making one assessment we might have different opinions on each of the factors on each of the factors trust me that how that is how subjective this issue is so if uh until and unless the uae brings in more detailed guidelines in terms of you know some numbers or in terms of some quantitative aspects until then we have these qualitative aspects to look at until then we have uh you know for us as consultants it is very important to mitigate the risk or at least if not mitigate inform about this risk to the clients and uh, because the again the consequences are draconian 
So you might have subsidiaries across the globe, but everything is being managed sitting from UAE. So what do you do? Do you tax those subsidiaries also in UAE? Yes or no? And, uh, you know, other provisions in the corporate tax law recognize this concept. So tax groups, qualifying groups, because once you be, you have poem in the UAE, you become a resident taxable juridical person. You are a resident taxable juridical person. You can be part of tax groups. You can do qualifying. Uh, you can have a qualifying group. You know, so you can you will be taxed as any other company incorporated in UAE. You will be taxed at par. All the rules will apply to you. All the reliefs will also apply to you. So this is something that has to be seen in terms of each entity operating outside the UAE but might or might not be effectively managed in the UAE. I mean, these factors are just indicative. That's what OECD also says. Of course, there are certain other considerations like, okay, there's a bank account of an uh, of a entity outside UAE in UAE, right, as a non-resident company, or the signatories sit here, or the employees are here, or the senior management is here. So there are a couple of more factors that have to be seen. Uh, question should be, how should we determine it? Uh, I mean, this is something uh, very specific to each entity. So you have to sit with the management of each entity to understand the complete value chain of the business, where the value is flowing from, who has decision-making powers, who is just a namesake director, who is just a namesake manager, who literally or really in terms has power. Because OEM is something which can be seen from conduct but proof from a contract. So basically your conduct should be such that your poem does not come into UAE if that is something that you want and mitigate the poem risk. But you should also have supporting documentations to show it and to document in terms that, okay, by so-and-so documents, my place of victim management is not in the UAE. So your word is not enough. A, you need to show the conduct and B, you need to show the contract or the documents. So we have a uh, poem. I, I, I have just taken a very broad overview on it. Of course, there are various nuances here. But again, uh, as well, Ramsar in the initial introduction mentioned that uh, this the aim of this webinar is to delve into certain topics, touch upon them, and uh, you know share what I have in terms of uh, my experience on these issues. And uh, with that, with that note, we'll move ahead to the next topic of permanent establishment. So what is a permanent establishment? You will see permanent establishment, you know, in uh, three, three ways actually now in the UAE corporate tax law. So we will talk about all these three and of course it will be brief and we'll talk about all these three. So the first type of permanent establishment is a permanent establishment in a foreign jurisdiction. Let us say Germany, let us say India, let us say UK of a UAE resident juridical person. So there is a company, LLC incorporated in UAE, has a permanent establishment in Germany. So how does it will be, how will it be a permanent establishment? It will be a permanent establishment as per the laws of that jurisdiction. And it will, it had the law of that jurisdiction or the domestic tax law of that jurisdiction has to be read in uh, in uh, I would say in line with the double tax avoidance agreement between UAE and Germany in our example. If there is no double tax avoidance agreement, then you directly stick to the domestic tax law. So first category of permanent establishment is a foreign permanent establishment or a foreign PE of a UAE juridical person or a company incorporated in the UAE. And when I say PE, I'll always over here mean permanent establishment and not participation exemption at all. Uh, because of this confusing confusion between the two terms, uh, a lot of times when even we are having discussions, someone says, okay, they have PE. Like, no, they don't have PE. Like, oh no, they are getting participation exemption. So this is something. So whenever I say PE, it's permanent establishment and not participation exemption. Uh, so yeah. So moving ahead, the first category is done. Second category is a PE in UAE of a foreign juridical person. So a company incorporated in India or Germany, let us say, is having a permanent establishment in UAE. 
the rule stays the same. So the rule is see what the domestic law of UAE to determine whether a foreign company is having a permanent establishment in UAE, yes or no. Then you go on to a double tax avoidance agreement to see whether there is any relief or the definition is different, yes or no. So once as per the domestic tax law of UAE, a foreign company or a foreign entity has a permanent establishment in UAE, what are the consequences? Consequences is that a permanent establishment is being taxed in UAE as a separate legal entity or a separate taxable person. So that permanent establishment has to pay tax in UAE full stop. On what? On the net income earned from that permanent establishment full stop. Going on to the third category. Third category is a little unique to UAE. Reason being we have a beneficial tax regime in the free zone. So a qualified free zone person, when I say qualified free zone person, we all understand it. it's a free zone person having satisfied all the six conditions given in the ministerial decision and the corporate tax law and uh, obtaining a 0% tax rate on its taxable income. So if a qualifying free zone person can have a permanent establishment in the mainland, this concept is unique and to UAE and is called a domestic PE or a domestic permanent establishment. So three categories, foreign PE of a UAE entity, UAE PE of a foreign entity, domestic PE of a qualified free zone person. So these are the three things that we will talk and see about on permanent establishments. So this slide is talking about a UAE PE of a non-resident or a foreign juridical person. So again, two things are main. There are two types of PE that have been explained in the UAE corporate tax law, article uh, 14. Yeah. So first is if a non-resident non or a juridical non-resident, let us say we'll term it as non-resident, has a fixed or permanent place in UAE from which it is conducting part or fully conducting its business. So if you are doing business inside the, entity, uh, inside the UAE, you will have a permanent establishment. Second is a agency permanent establishment. So if a non-resident person has someone in the UAE who is habitually exercising uh, the contracts and you know signing contracts, negotiating contracts, or a non-resident has appointed a UAE resident as an uh, agent for their business and the agent has powers or decision-making powers, it creates a permanent establishment in the UAE for a non-resident person. Then third one, third one talks about nexus. The nexus right now, only one uh, situation has been given in the decisions by the uh, Ministry of Finance uh, is on if a foreign or a non-resident juridical person has immoral property in the UAE will be considered as having nexus in the UAE. So three things we have covered, a fixed place permanent establishment. So you have a fixed place in UAE and non-resident has a fixed place in UAE from which it is carrying out its business, either wholly or partially also it's covered. Second is on if you appoint an agent in UAE and then that agent is given powers of decision making, negotiation, contract entering, and that through that agent you are doing that business uh, business in the UAE. Then also will have a agency P. So the outcome that you see on right side of the screen. So if any of these happen, the non-resident will be considered as having a permanent establishment in the UAE. So what we talked about it earlier was on the consequences. That the consequences of having a PE in UAE. UAE is that the PE will be taxed as a separate legal entity, a separate legal person on its net taxable person and all the laws, all the rules of income determination or any other rule of the corporate tax law is applicable to that permanent establishment as well. So I'll, I'll directly go on to how you can have a fixed place permanent establishment. So what the law talks about under Article uh, 14 Clause 2 is certain specific situations. So these situations are not exclusive. These are just, uh, I would say, uh, more uh, like an indicative list that how a fixed place permanent establishment can be made. So A, the answer to someone's question earlier, okay, place of management should be part of PE and not POEM. So it's part of both. So you have to see if you have management sitting in UAE, and you have fixed place or let's say an office where that management sits, it becomes part of permanent establishment of a non-resident entity as well. So only difference is that, okay, if just we're saying management, it's a very broad term. 
So if PE comes in the UAE, only income attributed to that PE is taxable. But if the POEM comes to UAE, the worldwide income is taxable. So POEM is a little more harsh. That is why there are more strict conditions for that. Second, if you have a branch in UAE, so foreign entities having branches in UAE, they all have PE. Branch has to register, has to pay tax, do the compliance. If they have a factory, workshop, immobile properties already also covered with nexus, offices, including, you know, temporary office. It's not necessary that you need to own an office to have a permanent establishment. A rental premise is also, can also be considered as a permanent establishment. So in UAE, we do not buy office. We rent a space to sit, even in a co-working or in a business center, you might have exposure to permanent establishment risk. Who, ha who will have the exposure? A non-resident. Moving ahead, there were certain specific situations again, uh, which will create permanent establishment. Uh, so installation of uh, structures for use of natural resources, mines, oil, wells, queries. So any vessels for extraction of oils, they create a permanent establishment because again, more or less they are fixed. Second, or the last one over here is a construction site, a building or place of assembly, but they have put a threshold over here that we will consider that construction site or building or that project as a permanent establishment only if it is continuing for a period of six months, more than six months actually. So a non-resident construction entity is constructing, let us say, uh, a residential building in the UAE without having a SPV or a local entity. The commercials are separated, okay, it might or might not get the contract, that's a separate story. So it is trying to construct it in the UAE and has spent more than six months uh, constructing that building so that project or that construction will be termed as a permanent establishment the def, uh, the technical term for it is the construction PE so there will be a construction PE so any income you earn from that would be taxable in the UAE in the hands of a non-resident so there are certain uh, I would say exceptions also uh, I'll just show those exceptions if uh, we have it I think we have it in the next slide. Yes. So if you have a fixed place of business, right, but the purpose of that fixed place is just to store goods, display goods, or deliver goods, uh, or, you know, keeping the stock of goods, or just collecting information of about, you know, or doing a market research or some other preparatory or auxiliary activity. When I say preparatory auxiliary, it is very similar to ancillary. So it should not be part of your core business, you know, and it, it should uh, be essential of the main, it should consist, uh, considered as essential of the main activity as a whole. But separately, it is nothing. So it could be any other preparatory auxiliary activities apart from what we have defined in you know, the storage, display, collecting of information, market research. These all fall into the category of uh, preparatory and auxiliary. So if you're doing any of those activities from a fixed place, you have given the, the UAECT law has given a specific exemption about it, that this might, uh, this will not be covered as a uh, permanent fixed place, permanent establishment. So the example over here, what we have is a US company is having a fixed place of operations or business in the UAE, but it is just doing, you know, preparatory auxiliary activities like marketing, market research, and, you know, just going, attending seminars and meeting people, or just trying to know the market as such. And they have an office, they have full-fledged everything over here, but only for these limited purposes, it will not be considered as a permanent establishment in the UAE. And another example, what we have over here is, uh, again, a US company having a place of business over here just for the display or storage of goods of the US entity. Uh, it has a warehouse in the UAE. So it will not still be considered as a permanent establishment, even though it has a fixed place of operations or fixed place of business in UAE, but still it will fall under the exception or the categories which are exempt from establishing a permanent establishment in the UAE. Uh, yeah, so this, this sums up, you know, what is a PE, what is not a PE. What we haven't talked about is a domestic PE. So... All the concepts what we are looking over here in this example, let us say from a US UAE angle, you just replace US with the free zone or a qualifying free zone person. So FCO is a qualifying free zone person and you replace UAE with UAE mainland, right? So all the concepts of a non-resident having PE in UAE apply to the domestic PE concept that 
if a qualifying freeze on person, let's say, has a place of management in mainland, it's a PE. It has a branch in mainland, yeah, it's a PE. Has a fixed place of operation from, you know, where he's effectively doing business, yes, it's a PE. So the domestic PE concept has been borrowed just to prevent tax planning and tax evasion. And uh, all the, you know, uh, smart people like us, so we do not be over smart. That's why the uh, Ministry of Finance or the cabinet has brought in this concept of uh, domestic PE. Because I always say that uh, we chartered accountants or tax professionals are very smart creatures. It, it just takes some time for the tax authorities to be more smart than us and tell us that we are still the rule makers. So that's that's on, on PE. A related con concept over here on foreign tax credit, why we have put it, uh, I'll explain it very quickly because then we have to take Q&A in the next five minutes. So why foreign tax credit? So let us, let us have a situation wherein a UAE entity, is you know, was exposed to a permanent establishment risk and has uh, now a permanent establishment in Germany. So what happens? Just like UAE, Germany will also impose tax on that permanent establishment. But the income of that permanent establishment is also being consolidated, consolidated into the UAE entity. UAE will also ask for tax on that uh, permanent establishment or a branch office, whatever you want to say. So what happens? There is double taxation. So now comes in a tool to mitigate double taxation that is a foreign tax credit. So what the law says that, okay, no problem if you have paid tax in the in a country outside UAE and we are also asking tax on it, no problem, we'll give you the credit for the tax credit. That is one. Second option is there on a foreign PE exemption. So they have given you an option to elect for a foreign PE exemption. So this, is, this option is available to UAE uh, taxable persons who have foreign permanent establishment that we will completely exempt the income, the expenses and the tax paid in the other country and you pay tax only on the uh, income of the head office or basically exclude the income of the permanent establishment per se from the tax calculation. So these two options are available for mitigating double taxation of foreign permanent establishment of a UAE taxable person. A very small example over here. Uh, we have taxable income. We'll directly start at 2.8 million. So a taxable income of a UAE person is 2.8 million. So the tax payable, you know, after removing 375 and taxing the rest at 9%, will come around 200,000. Uh, we paid tax on a foreign source income at 10,000. So the credit for that will be available. And uh, we will uh, pay the remaining tax that is 208,000 roughly. So the second option available here was that we would have excluded the revenue and the expenses from the 10 million and 7.2 million and then calculated the taxable income and finally paid tax on that. So they've tried to cover uh, a lot of ground uh, with respect to permanent establishment and with respect to place of active management. Again, I'll give you a very, very brief fact on the permanent establishment concept. So in the area of international taxation, out of all the litigation in the world, one third of the litigation is on the issue of permanent establishment. So now you see how litigative this topic is, how again subjective this topic is, and how I term it is, it is a very touchy subject for any of the tax authorities that whether a foreign entity is having a permanent establishment it's in its jurisdiction, yes or no. So this has to be examined in detail. Whether there is a thumb rule or there's a formula to examine it, no. It is a subjective study. It is a factual study. Facts of each case are, case, case are different and each case has to be studied in detail in terms of, again, the same things, the conduct and the contract. So those are my two cents on these two topics. And I'll uh, put it over to Balram, sir, for uh, any questions and uh, to move it forward. Yeah, thank you, Rishabh, for sharing your uh, knowledge and experience on uh, poem and permanent establishment. Yeah, as you mentioned, it is uh, not a subject which can be you know, uh, given any answer straight away, either yes or no. So it has to be looked into clearly and consider various facts. 
and then accordingly decide. So as I mentioned, anything that we discussed so far or whatever we're going to answer for your questions. So there are only uh, responses from each individuals on individual capacities. And uh, we may be answering this only based on the limited understanding or limited facts that you share with us. So if we consider the uh, all the relevant facts of the case, so the conclusion could be different. So on the screen, you can see the contact details of uh, Spectrum. If you have uh, any further requirement in terms of consultation on corporate tax or transfer pricing, audit, accounting, and uh, value added tax, you can reach out to us. As I mentioned, we have another entity which is exclusively uh, dealing with corporate tax and transfer pricing uh, services, which is SBC Tax Consulting LLC based out in UAE in Dubai. So we will be happy to uh, get back to you. If you have any questions, you can share in the chart window here, as well as uh, you can reach out to us on the email mentioned on the screen. I think there are some questions. Uh, there is one question at the beginning of uh, the session. Uh, the question was from Mr. Mohammed uh, Goes. If 12 member family own both uh, residential and commercial and uh, given power, power of attorney to one of the person to manage and rent the real estate under him by registering him as sole proprietor, can you please clarify the CT applicability? Uh, so here uh, it's one family mem family that is giving power of attorney to, to one individual to manage it. So it's only the the power that is given. Uh, and second thing is that in corporate tax law they have not mentioned or there is no separate uh, uh, bifurcation uh, whether it is residential or commercial properties that will be considered for taxation. As I mentioned, it is based on the way that you conduct based on the requirement of uh, having license or not having license, will it be considered as a business or not? So those are the things that we need to look at to decide whether the income will be subject to tax or not. In this case, if it is just a property that is managed by one person instead of 12 people involving in this, so the, I think the answer will not be different, whether it is owned by one person or owned by 12 members and then given the power to manage to one person, so the conclusion is going to be same. If it is not a business activity or not conducted as a business, then it is not subject to tax. Otherwise, it will be subject to tax. So dividend earned by a company locally came under purview of corporate tax. So yeah, generally, the dividends uh, that you earn from local companies are exempted incomes. There are other conditions only if you Good, uh, di earn dividend out uh, from your uh, incomes from foreign investments as well as capital gains either locally or outside. So, but yeah, generally dividends that you earn from local companies are exempted in the hands of individuals as well as in the hands of the companies. So, the question is we can claim foreign tax rate to 10k. Uh, so, that was just in my example saying that okay, I have paid 10k in the UAE and a foreign tax credit discussion is completely. A uh, separate discussion which can go on for another 30 40 minutes. So I'll not go deeper into it, but of course, I'll mention a thumb rule that uh, maximum credit allowed is the maximum tax payable in UAE. So there are two things that you'll have to see what is the foreign tax paid on a pre taxed income, and se second is what is the tax payable in UAE on that uh, income. So the lower of both would be allowed as a foreign tax credit, there is no limit for that but there is also no refund or carry forward of any of the excess foreign tax credit. Then we have uh, another question on uh, company incorporated on 1st October 2023, year end chosen 31st December, first full year to be filled in courses, okay, current year 2024 by September 30th, 2025, first full year to file, okay, corporate tax return. Is the company supposed to file CT for October to December? So I, I'll give my opinion or uh, views that A, you, you have to. to... Okay, Balram, Balram, sir, will. Yeah. Now, here, I think uh, whether it is uh, part of the year or full year, uh, if the financial year is falling after 1st of June 2023, so for you, the corporate tax will be applicable. So the only thing is that. Uh, uh, 
So the for for the period October to December 2023, uh, corporate tax will be applicable or not. Generally, uh, you are expected to have minimum six months period under IFRS also, or a maximum 18 months period for a financial year, and especially for a first financial year. So since October to December is not more, not no more than six months. I assume that you, know, you need to include this, plug this along with 24 year and then file it together. So that's what I think that you, know, you have to club and then file it for 12 months, 13 months or 14 months by the end of December 24, which means after 24, December 24, in 2025, you will be doing the file, first filing. I can see the word, the word uh, several residential properties in the taxation of natural persons. How many properties will be considered for this word? So, uh, as I mentioned clearly in my opening notes, uh, they have not given any quantity as to how many number of properties that you can hold, which will not be considered as income from business or not considered as business activity. No uh, specific number of properties, no amount as such given. It is very, very subjective and it is a very gray area to look at it. As I mentioned, those three or four parameters are what you need to look at and then decide it accordingly. But there is no specific count or number as such. Yeah, so we have another interesting question in terms of what about a rep office of bank. So usually rep office are, are not allowed to have income. But if they are doing a commercial activity, they'll be considered as a permanent establishment and tax like any other company. And uh, if it's not just your rep office will usually never have the authority to have a commercial activity in having them. I see one more question, CT registration later on. Uh, it is mandatory to upload the trade license of all the corporate partners. How to handle a situation where one of the partners is a foreign company? I, I know where you're coming from. Uh, there are some issues uh, or technical issues on registration portal. Uh, if a company has got uh, partners or shareholders who are, uh, or who is a foreign company. So in that registration form, you're expected to uh, the select, if you have a corporate uh, as a shareholder, select the licensing issue, uh, issue uh, licensing author issuing authority of that particular foreign or shareholder company. Uh, as of now, the uh, portal does not allow or uh, does not give the option to select any other authority, license issuing authority outside of UAE. So at the moment, we are unable to do that in, in an official way or in the way that is available. FT also is uh, still uh, considering this, how to handle it and how to take it forward. But at the moment, it is not allowed or the option is not given. I know there are people who are handling it in a different way, but uh, that's not a legal or not an uh, ideal way to handle this. I think uh, the, the question from uh, Santosh is that I missed the beginning of this session. An individual having rental income on commercial property have any obligation to file a corporate tax return. As I mentioned a while ago also, there is no distinction given between commercial property and residential, pro residential property for corporate tax purpose. It is one and same. It's only thing is whether this is considered as having business or business activity conducted. Accordingly, the corporate taxability, uh, whether income will be subject to tax or not, will be decided. However, we will share our uh, entire uh, presentation along with the video. If you leave your uh, mail IDs, if you do not, if you do not give us earlier, uh, you will get all these details anyway. I think last question that we have, under which category a civil company should be registered? Let's assume there are two partners in this civil company. Civil company is considered as well as like an unincorporated partnership uh, kind of thing. So the shareholders or partners in that civil company will be individually uh, considered as taxable persons. The share of profit and share of income versus and then share of expenses, then your profit is what is uh, taxable in the hands of the partners who are uh, shareholders and partners in the civil company. I think, yeah, uh, those are all the questions. Uh, and we also uh, done with the time as well. So thank you each and everyone for uh, attending this session. And uh, I thank Rishabh also to share his knowledge and experience on these uh, critical or important areas or the concepts.
and uh, as i mentioned you can leave, you can reach out to us on the numbers number mentioned there or on the, the email id available on the screen and uh, thank you everyone have a good day